Hello everyone and welcome to another Let's Play. My name is Anna Mortal and this is A Little Lily Princess by Hanako Games. We are nearing the end of Act 1 and we're doing a Lavinia walkthrough. And as I explained in the last video um, where we did Act 1, I'm skipping most of the stuff we've already seen. So if you are just coming fresh to my feed, you probably want to look at the full playlist for a little, little Lily Princess, because otherwise this isn't going to make a whole lot of sense. So <laughs> let's dive back into the story. We are technically we're still in Act One. We're about to leave Act One. And what happened when we left off was Sierra's father has been investing in diamond mines and Lavinia is having a hard time adjusting to this. I didn't talk about this before because I, I never know how much to, to nitpick on little things, but the writing is kind of portraying Lavinia as having a breakdown in her mental health. Um, I think it's kind of on the fence, but you see her, you know, carrying the cat around and singing to it. And, and there's suggestion that she's help that she harms the birds outside Irma Gern's window by setting the cats on them. Um, and of course she's losing all decorum and shouting in the hallways. And she just got, uh, scolded by Miss Minchin for acting out. And, um, I have kind of mixed feelings on that because I'm a person with mental health uh, issues. I live with I live with depression. I I have OCD. I have a, a phobia diagnosed, um, and I have a lot of anxiety issues as well. So kind of a you know a grab bag fun bucket of mental health stuff, and you know none of that actually makes me dangerous or scary. Uh, in fact, people with mental health problems are far, far more likely to be hurt by other people than to hurt someone themselves. Um, so I'm a little wary because it looks like Lavinia is being set up as having a mental health breakdown. And of course, she's mean and dangerous. But I also trust Hanaku Games. I think they're pretty good people. Um, and I think they're aware of a lot of this. And I think, <laughs> I'm hoping, we're going to see a turnaround in Act 2 where Lavinia is treated with, um, you know, respect and gentility and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's part of why I haven't been commenting on it. Because the first time I did a playthrough with Jesse, I kind of knew I wasn't going to see a resolution on that. Because I wasn't doing the, the Lavinia ending. Um... And then now I, I haven't talked about it as much because I've been skipping some of that. But we just saw a little bit of it there with Lavinia. I, you know, swooshed by it. But with Lavinia shouting in the hallways and Miss Minchin telling her that she's acting incredibly inappropriate and not like the good English girl she's always trying to be. And so, you know, now we're going to see, I hope, some resolution and closure on that. And I really, really hope that the mental health issues will be treated with, um, you know, with, with respect. And I think they will be. I hope they will be. Um, but that's my little, you know, we'll just put the pin in there for social justice issue of the week is that, you know, I'm, I'm mentally ill by any, um, reasonable definition of that term. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel bad about it. Um, and it doesn't make me dangerous or mean that I kill birds or whatever. I love birds and my cat loves birds. My cat doesn't go outside. All right. So this is Lavinia shouting again. More Lavinia shouting. We'll just skip that. Skip. I'm trying to get to the birthday party, which is when horrible things happen. Skip. Skip. Goodness gracious, I thought it happened at week 20, but it 
We're well into 21. This is a long game, and that was the other reason why I didn't want to read everything. Okay, so this is a mismentioned planning for Sarah's birthday party, and you get to see the creditor who's involved with all the expenses that Miss Minchin is going into expecting to be paid back by Mr. Crew later. And that was a pretty birthday party dress. Okay, here we go. It was at last the day of Sarah's birthday party. There had been no further word from her papa but at this moment, Sarah was too carried away with anticipation to feel disappointment. Sarah entered the Holly Hung schoolroom as the head of a sort of procession. First, there was Miss Minchin in a grand silk dress and Sarah herself guided by her hand. A manservant followed, carrying the box containing the last doll, which is a, a new extravagant doll that... that was commissioned for Sarah and it'll be her last doll. Cook carried a second box and Becky brought up the rear. So I'm gonna skip through a lot of this. <laughs> okay. Where's my control? If I start skipping, we're gonna zip. There we go. <laughs> All right. In her office, Miss Minchin was meeting with a familiar visitor. Good day, Mr. Barrow. Have you come to see the goods? I can assure you the doll is just as expected. A hundred pounds. All expensive material and made it a Parisian modiste. He spent, mo he spent money lavishly enough, that young man. Captain Crewe is a man of fortune. The diamond mines alone. Diamond mines. There are no such thing. Never were. What? What do you mean? At any rate, it would have been much better if there never were. Diamond mines spell ruin oftener than they spell wealth. When a man is in the hands of a very dear friend and is not a businessman himself, he had better steer clear of the dear friend's diamond mines or gold mines, or any other kind of mines dear friends want his money to put into. The late Captain Crew is dead, ma'am. Died of jungle fever and business troubles combined. The jungle fever might not have killed him if he had not been driven mad by the business troubles. And the troubles might not have put an end to him if the fever had not assisted. So, the diamond mines didn't work out and Captain Crew is dead and he has no money left because he had been spending it all in expectation of getting more and now Miss Minchin has gone deeply into debt over Sarah. So Sarah is of course stricken. Her She doesn't care about the money nearly so much as she cares about the fact that her father is dead. And I, the light has just gone out of her eyes and it, it hurts me so much um, because she, she didn't care about the money nearly as much as she cared about her father and she'll never see him again. And Ms. Minchin is going to keep her on as a servant in an attempt to recoup some of the costs that she's put into Sarah. And now we live in an attic. So, now that Sarah is no longer a student, her time is filled with chores and the kinds of icons she can gather have changed. We have hunger, fatigue, pride, pain, chill, sorrow. Um, and now I'm going to stop and cry because it, it really does make me so sad that... Um, And I don't know what we should be working towards. So we'll just do a little bit of everything. Look how sad she is. It makes me so sad. Okay, we've got hunger, fatigue, pride, pain, chill, and sorrow. So now we're working in the kitchen. And now we're going to go see Lavinia. 
It was difficult for Sarah, when walking through the halls of Miss Minchin's, to meet the eyes of girls who had until recently been her friends and companions. Neither she nor they knew how to react. Less painful, then, to keep her eyes downcast. If she did not see their faces, then she would not have to see them turn and look away. Besides, looking at the floor could be quite interesting. Tiled floors had a relaxing sort of beauty in the way that colors looped and repeated as you went along, while each swirl in a wooden floor was unique. And sometimes the floor contained pebbles or spider webs or little clumps of horse-scented London mud, and that was also something useful for Sarah to see so she could clean them. She was no longer a guest in these halls, but a servant. And so Sarah walked quietly with her eyes fixed upon the floors and did not see Lavinia coming. You! The weight of Sarah's burdens were such that she had no energy to be startled by this occurrence. Her head raised, slowly but surely, her eyes fixed upon Lavinia's flushed cheeks. What does she have to be upset about? Get out of my way, you horrible little rat! I am not a rat, and I am not in your way. There is plenty of room for you to walk around me, or me to walk around you. Don't you dare come near me! Do you know what you almost did? You could have ruined my family! What? I trusted you! I listened to you! You're a curse! Everything you touch is ruined! That... that can't be! Why are you even still here? Get out of my sight! It isn't my fault. It can't be my fault. Confused and adrift, Sarah reached out her hand to the girl who had once been, if not her friend, then at least her guide in the world of Miss Minchin's society. Lavinia recoiled, just as horrified as if a toothless beggar on the London streets had made a grab for the hem of her skirt. Stay away! With that, she ran past Sarah, keeping a safe distance, and disappeared into her room. I didn't do anything. It wasn't me. It can't have been me. She put her hand against the wall for support, then snatched it away as if her hand, like a mummy's rotted claw, might despoil the purity of the surface. My papa is dead. My mama is dead. Maybe I am cursed. Maybe it was my fault. No, it's okay. I wasn't using that heart. Oh. I'll just keep going. I should have saved. I didn't save. I need more sorrow. Okay, I should have saved, I should have saved, I should have saved, I should have saved, I should have saved. And it says sets route too, but I think there's enough. We need sorrow. What gives us sorrow? That doesn't give us sorrow. All right, here we go. We want sorrow. There is some sorrow. Okay, that's all the sorrow we need. Okay, here we go. Sarah rubbed her hands as she walked, trying to massage away the marks that had been left by carrying something heavy and uncomfortable for too long. With her eyes downcast, she did not notice who precisely was nearby until she heard a voice call out. Sarah? Lavinia? Miss Herbert. The rebuke was swift, but just as quickly the frown of distaste smooth and stilled. It was a face such as Lavinia had shown when Sarah first met her, one with a haughty lift to the nose and a wicked curl to the lips. It was not a friendly face, but neither was it the face of horror and fury she had displayed upon the previous encounter. Instead, she reminded Sarah of nothing so much as Miss Minchin herself, a comparison which was heightened when she grew a decidedly false smile. Poor Sarah. Events have not been kind to you, have they? Answer me when I speak to you. I have met with misfortune. 
It seemed too obvious to need stating, but Lavinia's temper could not be trusted. You poor thing! To have had so much and had it all taken away. It must have been a terrible shock. Of course it was. It was a shock for us as well, you know. I was caught quite by surprise. You must forgive me for my words the other week. They were uncalled for. Of course you were not to blame. You will forgive me, won't you? If you are sorry, then I forgive you. Inside, her little heart burned. But if Lavinia recognized any insincerity in Sarah's words, she did not respond to it. Good, good. So, Sarah, where are you sleeping these days? I notice that your room, your old room, has been given to a new boarder. I sleep in the attic. How quaint! Do you still have your lovely bed and cushions and your tiger skin rug? No, all of my things are gone. Miss Minchin took them. Oh dear! And your clothing? You do seem to have been wearing that same scrap of a dress for quite some time now. Of course you are in mourning, but mourning clothes should still be fitted. Miss Minchin took my clothes as well. Lavinia tapped her fingers against her cheek. Simply dreadful! And of course your maid, Mariette, has also left us. Do you truly have nothing, then? Not one jot or tittle of all your precious past? Her eyes glittered like candles in the depths of a cave. Emily is all I have left. Emily! Oh, yes, your doll! Your first doll, not the one that... Well, at least you have that comfort. I wish you would stop talking. You are not my friend, and you are not making me feel any better. Well, you were a diligent servant and a clever girl. I'm sure you will adapt to your new circumstances. You understand, of course, that we cannot be friends or even acquaintances any longer. Your station has fallen too far. It would be unseemly. I understand. You are never my friend. You are saying these things to bait me, and it is cruel. I shan't keep you any longer. I'm sure you have much work to do. Yes, I do. Goodbye. There was no use in arguing with Lavinia or chafing at her rudeness. She would do as she chose, and nothing Sarah said could affect it. All she could do was agree and leave as quickly as possible. She did not see how Lavinia's eyes followed her as she walked, nor how those soft, pampered lips stretched in a hungry smile. Whew. I don't know which... I don't know which, um things we should be trying to do. Sarah faced Lavinia's door with a sense of trepidation. She had walked already from room to room along this hallway, gathering more items of clothing to weigh down the basket of laundry that she carried. Lavinia's room she had bypassed as long as possible. If only she would leave! If she would go out for a walk, then I could enter her room and fetch her things and there would be no trouble. It was no use. Lavinia was firmly ensconced and knocking was necessary. The basket would not grow any lighter for waiting. Jessie, is that you? No, Miss Herbert, it's Sarah. I've come for your washing. Come in. Sarah shifted the basket so she could reach the door. Inside, Lavinia was seated at her desk, a novel held open in her hand. She did not turn to look at Sarah as she entered. I'm sure you can find things without my aid. Yes, Miss. She walked around the room, Determined to be as quick as possible, but Lavinia's discarded clothing had apparently found its way into the most inconvenient locations. What is a gown doing all the way under the bed? She would never crawl into such a place herself. An ostentatious rustling sound drew Sarah's attention back to the desk where the room's occupant sat. 
On the surface of the desk sat an open box in two parts. The top piece was decorated with a picture of a young girl dressed in frills, holding a, kitchen to, a kitten to her cheek. The interior was packed with tissue paper. It was this that had rustled, and something else. Chocolates. It was a box of chocolates, each one dark and rich and doubtless decadently delicious. Some milk, some fondant, some nut. Sarah's mouth watered at even this brief glance. Chocolates. Lavinia turned her head and smiled lazily. Oh, yes. I bought a box of chocolates when I was out in town. I was planning on sharing some with Jessie, but she hasn't stopped by. Are you hungry, Sarah? Sarah did not answer. She lowered her eyes. I asked you a question. Are you hungry? Yes. Would you like a chocolate? Yes. Now she will laugh and say I cannot have one. It is cruel to taunt me so. Why is she doing this? Of course, they are very expensive, and you have no money with which to pay for them. I had heard that in English society, it was considered vulgar to discuss matters of money. Lavinia's eyes narrowed, and her book hit the desk with a thump. This is not society. Of course, you do have one item of some value left, don't you? We could make a trade. Give me your doll, Emily, and I will give you a chocolate. Sarah's pulse clattered dizzyingly inside her. What was Lavinia thinking? No. Don't you want a chocolate? Emily is worth more to me than chocolates. I suppose a single chocolate is not a fair trade. Give me your doll and I will give you the whole box. No. Why not? You said you were hungry. Were you lying to me? I am hungry, but I will not trade you Emily. A stupid doll is more important to you than food? Without warning, Lavinia grabbed the box of chocolates and hurled it into the fireplace, scattering the chocolates among the ashes. Oops. Oh well, I can always buy another. Do that then. Lavinia rose from her seat air hissing from her nostrils. You are a fool, Sarah Crew. You have no idea what is valuable in this world. You were never a lady. You're just a stupid child who believes in princesses and diamond mines. Didn't you believe in them too? They're nothing but fairy tales. There is no place for dreamers in this world, and that means there is no place for you. Lavinia took a deep breath calming herself and sank back into her chair. She sat, hands on her lap, back perfectly straight, the picture of poise and spoke. Get out. Yes, miss. Carrying the washing with her, Sarah left the room. Whatever Lavinia had wanted from her, she hadn't gotten it. Mm. This game hurts my heart. Oh. I have too much fatigue. Okay. Sarah was on her hands and knees scrubbing mud off the floor when a familiar voice called out to her. You! Scullery girl. You know my name. You are perfectly capable of using it when you think that it will make you sound more wise. But you are not wise. You call me a scullery girl because you would never recognize the value of a princess unless she were covered in diamonds. In the time it took to think these things, Sarah had sucked in a breath of air and let it out again. This simple, calming act allowed her to reply to Lavinia without heat. Yes, miss? I require your services in my room at once. I am already working. Are you disobeying me? No, miss. At least Lavinia's voice was strident enough that if Miss Minchin or Cook, if they were nearby, 
would be alerted that it was not Sarah's choice to abandon her duties. There was no guarantee of sympathy if she did not complete her tasks in time. If one or the other were in a foul mood, it would not matter how hard Sarah tried. She would always be at fault. It was only Sarah's pride and her innate desire to do the best she could in any circumstance that drove her on. She stood up, brushing her hands against the faded velvet of her skirt and trying not to shake too much dust onto the half-cleaned floor. Well, what are you waiting for? I didn't think you liked it when I walked at the head of the line. For a moment, Lavinia's cheeks puffed out like a squirrel. Perhaps because such an expression was unladylike, she soon replaced it with a smile. Of course, follow me. Lavinia's room did not appear particularly in need of care. The coals had not been overturned. The curtains had not been turned down. It was no more disorderly than any other girl's. Lavinia raised her head, looking down along her nose at Sarah. My bed is uncomfortable. I am having trouble sleeping. I want you to fix it. What's wrong with it? How should I know? I am not a servant. Sarah looked carefully at the surface of Lavinia's bed in case some hidden danger lay concealed beneath the quilt. No obvious lumps. She ran her hand across and felt nothing unusual. I don't see anything wrong. Try harder. Or have you forgotten what a bed is supposed to feel like? I suppose this is as close as you get to one these days. Sarah pushed her hand against the mattress. It felt firm, but yielding. Certainly far more comfortable than the worn-out pad that served for her own bed. Nothing seemed wrong. Perhaps your pillows need fluffing. Oh, have you not been tending my pillows properly? That could be the problem. You won't even lift a finger, will you? Irritated by Lavinia's demanding presence, in a hurry to return to her own chores, Sarah seized the nearest pillow without a further thought and began to crush and beat it. She did not sense the trap until a spray of feathers burst onto the floor. Oh no, you clumsy oaf! You've ruined it! Her teeth closed together in a fierce grin. You have ruined my pillow. You've made a terrible mess in my room. I am sorry. That's not good enough. You will have to pay for what you've done. Give me your doll and I will forgive you. Emily, again? I won't. Do you want me to tell Miss Minchin what you've done? She'll box your ears. Fine. Tell her. I still won't give you Emily. Lavinia snatched the pillow from Sarah's arms, heedless of the traces of down fluttering around them. Then you will have to pay me some other way. You, you will be my slave. You will serve me, morning and night. Doing what? Doing whatever I say. All night long if I say you have to. Or else give me your doll. You don't need a doll. Servants don't need toys. It was too strange. There seemed no purpose to Lavinia's actions. Nothing but cruelty. Why do you hate me so much? Why? Why? She thrust the pillow into Sarah's face, knocking her back onto the bed. You ruined everything. You stole my place. You took away my rights. You made me a laughingstock. You threatened my family. Sarah shoved the torn pillow off her face so she could see. How could I have done anything to your family? Your ridiculous diamonds. But your family didn't have anything to do with. In a flash, she saw it. Lavinia had been frightfully jealous of Sarah after the announcement of the diamond mines after her place as Miss Minchin's favorite had been well and truly lost. She would not have accepted that meekly. She would have fought tooth and claw to reclaim her superiority. You wrote to my father, didn't you? You tried to get him to invest in diamonds. You wrote to your father. My father is far too intelligent to be swayed by the fantasies of a silly little girl. Fantasies? That's all they were. Your father must have been as stupid as you are. He believed everything. Sarah caught her breath, tears pricking in her eyes. She rose from the bed. My papa was the kindest, most generous father in all the world. 
And if he believed in fantasies, then that is because fantasies are good and important. My father is a respectable gentleman who understands business and would not lose his head to childish nonsense. My papa listened to me. Does yours? Sarah felt the blow before she heard it. Once again, she was spent, sent sprawling back across Lavinia's bed. Lavinia loomed overhead, her face pale and strained, and her voice rumbled uncertainly as she spoke. You are... You are a curse, but you will not destroy me. I am stronger than you. Sarah rolled off the bed, out of Lavinia's reach. Keeping her eyes on the older girl, she began to inch her way towards the door. Lavinia looked around at the scattered feathers in increased disarray, as if unsure how it had all happened. You, you still owe me. Look what you've done. You owe me. I will clean your room later, when you are feeling better. You had better not tell any tales about this. Sarah shook her head slowly. Who would I tell? With that, she made her escape. Whew. So, we got really high fatigue, y'all. And I don't think that we lose the game and die if our fatigue gets too high, because I remember someone saying in the comments that that had been the developer plan, but they just couldn't bring themselves to do it because it was too depressing. And I'm I'm glad they did it, because that, that really would have just been incredibly depressing. Um, But it still makes me nervous. After the curious passion of their last encounter, Sarah made a special effort to avoid being alone with Lavinia. When possible, she traded tasks with Becky. If not, she let tasks in that room wait until Lavinia was not present, even if it meant risking a scold and scolding from Miss Minchin. Miss Minchin's anger was familiar and predictable. Lavinia's was not. I don't understand what she wants. Avoiding Lavinia had, for some while, been strangely easy. Where she was spending her time, Sarah did not know, but it was not in her room and not harassing Sarah. Perhaps she wishes to keep her distance as well. Lavinia always wanted to be the perfect lady. It can't be ladylike to act the way she did. That's why she didn't want me to tell anyone. But the respite could not last forever. The next summons came quite unexpectedly. Sarah, could you please come in here for a moment? Please? It must be some manner of trick, and yet it would not be polite to refuse. Hesitant as a doe approaching a groundskeeper, Sarah walked into Lavinia's room. Lavinia sat at her desk, straight-backed, and did not turn to face her. I should like you to brush out my hair. Slowly, please. Be gentle. Sarah picked up the silver-backed brush, feeling its smooth whorls warm against her skin, and stared at the back of Lavinia's head. It would be so easy, so very easy to strike her, or at least to tug harshly at her hair to catch every tangle and yank her prissy head out of line. The princess would not do such things. She took up the brush and began to perform as requested. Ah, I was correct. I can trust you. You're quite good at that, you know. You might make a lady's maid one day. Thank you. You have experience, after all. I'm sure your own maid must have brushed your hair like this. What was her name? Mariette? Yes. You think I'm horrible, don't you? Sarah did not answer. Of course, it doesn't matter what you think. You're beneath me now. Your opinion is irrelevant. Even to you, you must do as you are told. It doesn't matter what you think of me. It only matters what I think of myself. But no, I can be generous. You are a girl of good breeding, fallen on hard times. It is a tragic circumstance deserving of pity. How could any true English rose look upon you and not feel moved? And thus it behooves me to aid you. Aid me. Of course, though there is little I can do at the moment while I'm only a schoolgirl. 
but perhaps someday when I have my own household, I could make you my maid. You would live with me under my roof in my care. Isn't that generous? Sarah's fingers clenched hard around the handle of the brush. Miss Minchin said almost the same thing to me once. She brought me the black news and cast Mariette out and took away my books and my clothing and sent me to the attics and then asked me to thank her for her kindness. Lavinia made a sound in the back of her throat which might have been a muffled laugh. If she giggles at me, I will pull her hair out. I will. But no further laughter emerged. I can be much kinder than Miss Minchin when I choose to be. Here, Sarah, put that brush down. Come and sit on my bed. Lavinia took Sarah's hand in hers, not even commenting on the dirt. You must know that Miss Minchin will never reward your loyalty, no matter how much of it you give. You aren't important to her. She will use you as long as it is convenient and abandon you when it isn't. She never liked you anyway. Not since that day you showed her up at French lessons. C'est amusant. But I... I find you interesting. I can be good to you if you are good to me. I always feel that she wants something from me, but I never know what it is. Perhaps higher than a lady's maid. I could keep you as my official companion. If you are looking for a companion, I think Jessie would be a better choice. Lavinia dropped her hand. Jessie thinks nothing but what people tell her to think. What do I care for Jessie? Then what reward is there for Jessie's loyalty? Lavinia's mouth fell open, but she said not a word. Fearing an outburst, Sarah stood and moved away. If that's all you needed, I will be going now. She left the room, followed only by silence. Oh! We have had a breakthrough! I don't know what to select. <sighs> this part always makes me sick. That's part of why I'm skipping through the scenes. There you are. What? Thought you could stay in bed all day? Sarah rubbed her arms trying to warm them and chase the fog of sleep from her eyes. The sun isn't even up yet. The sun has more right to be lazy than you do. One of them young ladies wants her breakfast delivered to her room, so get to it. It went without saying that Sarah had not herself eaten breakfast, that she would not have time to snatch even a bite while preparing the meal, that the task might keep her out until all food was cleared away. It could not be helped. Sarah prepared the heavy tray, heaped with toast and fruit and eggs and kippers, and carried it up to Lavinia's room. The door was unhelpfully shut. I should have had Becky come up with me to knock. She dared not dare attempt to balance the tray one-handed, and calling through the door would be vulgar. Careful not to disarrange the contents, she set the tray upon a hall table. Oh, I remember this one. Away. Set the tray upon my desk and be quick about it. I have been waiting, you know. Yes, Miss Herbert. Okay, cut it back up. I'm sorry. I, I thought I remembered this event, which of course is ridiculous because we never got this far with Lavinia. Because there was another storyline where we walked into the room and Jesse tripped us. So, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, what is it? I've brought your breakfast. Oh good, please bring it in at once. Sarah opened the door, then turned back to pick up the tea tray again. Inside, Lavinia was seated like a queen upon her bed, her back supported by a nest of pillows. Set the tray upon my desk and be quick about it. I have been waiting, you know. Yes, Miss Herbert. Miss Herbert! And just think, not so very long ago, your Marriott would have done the same for you. 
No one brings you breakfast anymore, do they, Sarah? No. Perhaps we should call you Mariette, or Marionette, a poor pitiful puppet who dances for anyone who pulls your strings. Sarah took a deep breath, reminding herself that she was a princess, and a princess should not respond to such taunts. Not at all suitable for a lady's companion. I can't imagine what I was thinking. Well, I am certain I will find someone more appropriate in the future. I'm sure you will. If you are pleased, then I will go. Wait. She sat up in a smooth motion, her eyes never leaving Sarah, her head sliding in like that of a dancing cobra. Have you eaten today? No. Then please sit, share my meal. What? I ordered enough for two. Go ahead, it's safe. You made it yourself, didn't you? There's no trick. Unless you were trying to poison me in the kitchen. Of course not. Go on then, enjoy it. She moved closer so that she could reach the food from the side of the bed where she sat. Unable to muster any objection, Sarah pulled out the chair, sat down, and picked up a piece of toast. She looked over at Lavinia quickly in case the other girl would suddenly object or throw juice in her face. Nothing. Cautiously, Sarah bit a corner of the toast. You can do better than that. Look at you. You're far too thin for a girl. Put some kippers on that or at least some eggs. Lavinia spooned the soft scrambled eggs onto her own toast and ate with gusto. Does she truly mean to be kind to me? It had been a long time since Sarah had seen so rich a meal, and her nerves would not quite let her enjoy it any more than a doe could graze without care in the presence of a tiger. But she was a little girl, long deprived, and it was food, and it was available. She ate. After she finished her toast, Lavinia smiled at Sarah and licked her lips. You see, I can be generous. And you should work harder at your duties. Take this back to the kitchen and be quick about it. Don't you know that I need to dress for class? Yes, Miss Herbert. Do you pity me or despise me? I wish that you would say it clearly. My heart. Okay. I guess we'll go back to kitchen duty. Okay. Lavinia was out of her rooms that day, a circumstance about which Sarah was not sure whether to be pleased or dismayed. She can be kind when she chooses to be. The other girls sometimes give me such pitying looks, but they have never lifted a hand to aid me. Sarah remembered all too well how little treats had cost when she was a schoolgirl with pocket money. She remembered how many clothes she had owned, far more than she needed. Any one of the students at Miss Minchin's select seminary could have reached out to Sarah and made her life a little easier, just as she had once done for Becky. They did not. Not because they were hateful. They were only young girls. They did not consider Sarah's needs. They found her circumstances uncomfortable if they noticed at all. They looked away. Only Lavinia thinks about me enough to offer assistance. And only Lavinia thinks about me enough to be deliberately cruel. Would I be any better off as her servant rather than Miss Minchin's? She moved around the room picking up discarded items, straightening furniture, checking that the mended seam and the feather pillow had not come undone. Each student at Miss Minchin's had a simple trinket box for their own small treasures. Most kept one or two pieces of jewelry inside. Some added a pretty rock or a dried flower or seashell. That day, Lavinia's trinket box was out of place, pushed back against the wall. She must have fallen against her dresser this morning and jarred it loose. I hope nothing is spilled and become lost. Ever conscientious, 
Sarah went to her hands and knees on the carpet by the bed and looked underneath it. She could see nothing out of place. However, if something had fallen behind the dresser, she would first have to move that before she could see or reach any lost item. The dresser was large and heavy, and the mirror on top fragile. She would have to be careful. Sarah took hold of the sides and pulled, her thin arm straining. After a moment, the dresser shifted away from the wall, just enough to look. Ah! Her effort was rewarded. There was a bit of lost jewelry down there, swathed in dust. Lavinia herself would have had trouble reaching it, even if she'd known it to be present. But Sarah's two thin fingers now fit easily in small places. She pulled the glinting object free. It was a small oval locket, engraved with a twining leaf pattern around the edges on a fragile gold chain. The chain was not long. It must have been meant for a young child's neck. How long was this lying behind the dresser? Does this belong to Lavinia at all? The dust suggested that no one had moved that dresser in years. The locket might belong to a former pupil now grown. As she turned the rounded pendant over in her hands, the well-worn catch came loose of its own accord, falling open atop Sarah's palm and bearing its contents. Oh! The locket did not contain a portrait of young Lavinia, nor that of any child at all. It was the picture of a woman. Whose long black hair and dusky skin instantly brought back memories of hot summer breezes and the smell of red clay. An Indian woman? Lavinia's Aya? That's not a common picture to keep in a locket. Especially if Lavinia says she does not remember life in India. It is curious how much this woman resembles Lavinia. Oh, oh my. She might at that point have been able to replace the locket and leave the room with no one the wiser. It had been lost for some time and there was no reason for Lavinia to notice it had been disturbed. But Sarah was not afraid. Her heart was filled with excitement at her discovery, at the sense of kinship it evoked between herself and her former fellow. She forgot for a moment that all had changed between them. All she wanted was to sit with Lavinia and talk about India. That was why she sat on the bed and waited for Lavinia to return. Sarah? What are you? At the sight of the locket in Sarah's hands, Lavinia's face took on a disturbing hue of olive. Sarah, still innocently gazing at the portrait, did not notice. Is this your mother? She's very beautiful. I didn't realize you were of Indian ancestry. I am not. And now Sarah looked up. Seeing the expression of strangling rage, she instinctively shrank back against the pillows. I am English! English! With each shout, she stepped closer. Her shaking hands curled into claws, but the points were aimed backwards, threatening only herself. I am a pure English girl from a good family. I don't even remember India. It's rubbish, all of it. I'm a good girl. That's why my father sent me here. A good English girl. That's why they never visit, so I won't be marked. She slammed her hands down on the bed, trapping Sarah in place, and began to crawl forward with murder in her eyes. How dare you call me? Lavinia, stop it! For a moment, everything froze. Lavinia was crouched over Sarah like a stalking cat, her eyes wild, her hair hanging down around her face. Her breath came in harsh gasps. Fear sat like a sharp stone in Sarah's chest. Nothing in her life had prepared her for this reaction. She could neither speak nor move. Lavinia! Lavinia's shoulders trembled. Oh, God. Tears burst forth in a noisy wave. There was nothing beautiful about her face as she sobbed. Lavinia! There's nothing wrong with you. You can't tell anyone. I have to hide it. No one can know. I'm an English girl. 
I would be cast out, an outcast. Mariette was of mixed race, and no one objected to her. Mariette Dumas was a servant. I am a lady. No gentleman would marry. My mother had mixed blood. What? Y your mother was French. So was Mariette. I never knew my mother, but she might have looked just a little like you, and my father thought she was beautiful. Hazarding a smile, she held up the locket. You don't have to be ashamed. Lavinia snatched the necklace from her hand and threw it against the wall. Your father is dead, and you are a beggar. Worthless. Disgusting. I want nothing to do with you. Very well. She swung her feet down from the bed to stand, and Lavinia seized her arm. Don't go. Please, you can't. You mustn't tell anyone. Promise me. I'll kill you if you tell. Sarah looked into those frantic eyes and could no longer find in herself to be afraid. All she felt for Lavinia was pity. You never understood me. You never knew in your heart how to be a lady or a princess. Of course, I would not gossip about your mother. That would be vulgar. Again she moved and Lavinia clutched at her. Don't leave me. I have work to do. Don't you remember? I am a servant. At last, Lavinia's grip relented and Sarah climbed to her feet. I am sorry for you. We might have been friends. With that, she left Lavinia alone with her tears. What's going on? I thought I heard yelling. Sarah walked straight past her without speaking. Let Lavinia explain if she wants. Doesn't concern me. <sighs> so, I have feelings. And I don't really know how to manage my feelings. I'm... I love Lavinia, and I, I certainly deeply, thoroughly sympathize with the horrible position she's been put in where she's mixed race and has to, is trying to pass in English society and has to deny her family and never see them and never talk about them. That is horrible. I feel terrible for her. What I'm not as thrilled about is that the special after school lesson of you're not bad to not be white and here is what true ladyship and true princesship comes from. You know, that all of that came from a white girl. <laughs> like. I get why it was done this way in the context of a story, but I was a little uncomfortable in that scene because having the little white Sarah crew being the true princess and the mixed race Lavinia being the one that's portrayed as grasping and trying to be a social climber and and yet never truly grasping real gentility in her heart and not having princesship in her blood is an unfortunate FedEx arrow for that whole scene. Not intended, I'm sure, but not great. <laughs> we sold her on. I still love Lavinia. And I'm not saying that necessarily that it's any wrong, but it it's something that I wish that the game makers had thought about a little bit more. <laughs> oh well. I'm crying anyway, so I mean, emotionally it has been very impactful, there's no doubt about that. So, now we go speak with Lavinia again. The cold of a long London night was a terror far removed from the provinces of India. If 
if she were not sent out in the day, Sarah could wear stockings in bed to try and preserve some warmth in her toes. Too often, however, all that she owned were soaked or muddy. Shivering, she tucked the blanket more firmly under herself and waited for her own body warmth to build. Then, quietly, there came a rap at the door. Becky? She rose from her bed to see what was the matter. Lavinia! The older girl stood, candle in hand, breathing quickly from the uncommon exertion of mounting so many stairs. Sarah, I... Please, come to my room. My duties are finished for the day. I need to sleep. And if you wake Miss Minchin to complain I won't obey you, she'll scold you as much as me. That isn't the reason. I don't want you to work for me. I, I have things to give you. Lavinia lifted up onto her toes, trying to peer past Sarah's head into the attic room, but the flickering can circle of candlelight blinded her to all but what was directly in front of her. It, it's very cold up here, isn't it? My room is much warmer. Please, won't you come with me? Would it make me a bad person to refuse her when she keeps saying please? All right. They walked together through the dark seminary halls. Did you hear that? What? Like a door closing. I think you have imagined it. You were always so good at pretending things, and these halls are somewhat frightening in the dark. It would be easy to mistake a coat rack for some disturbing revenant crowned with thorns. If she has brought me here for a jest to try and frighten me, but no dark shape awaited them in Lavinia's room. Do you see? I bought some cakes for us to share. I have drinks as well. I should have liked to have tea with you, but there was no way to manage it without forcing you to make it yourself. But here in the dark, isn't it special? The cakes looked most appetizing, but Sarah, Sarah was weary and her heart no longer eager to trust. Why are you doing this, Lavinia? You don't call me Miss Herbert anymore. No, I don't. That's all right. You don't have to. What? Please, sit down. Have some ginger cake and the soda water. It is meant to be very healthful. I want you to be well. Mystified, Sarah took a seat and accepted the bottle that Lavinia handed her. The glass vial had a rounded bottom, so once the cork was removed from the neck, she could not set it down until it was empty. It was late, but there were never any days in which Cook provided her so much food that a snack could be unappealing. Still, the question lingered. Why are you doing this? Because... Because I am lonely. You are the only person who I have no reason to be afraid of anymore. You have already seen the worst of me. And you make a better companion, a better confidant than Tybalt. A cat? So you see me as a pet. If I wanted a pet, I would keep Jessie. Lavinia laid her hand on Sarah's knee, a hand with clean, gently buffed nails and fingers that had never known hard labor. We understand each other, don't we? We are two of a kind. You are the truest friend I have ever known. If that were true, what a pitiable thought, for we are not friends at all. Outside these walls, in society, I must fit myself to their mold if I am to succeed. There was no one else I can talk to, unvarnished about books or bones or blood. No gentleman would have me if he knew all the thoughts in my head, if he knew my secrets. I refuse to end up like me. Yes. And I do not wish to see you languish here either. I want you for my companion, Sarah, as I said before. Miss Minchin despises you. She will use you until you are dry. And you won't. Aren't you going to eat your cake? I am eating it. The cake was rich and sticky and delicious, with a hint of orange to accompany the ginger. The soda water was fizzy and strange, but not unwholesome. 
There was nothing wrong with the food. I want to take care of you. To save you. You can't take me away. You don't have a household. When we're older, then. There are things I can do for you now. Yes, thank you for the food. She set the empty bottle on the desk surface, placed carefully so that it would not roll. I should return to my room now. But it's so cold up there. Why don't you sleep in my bed? What? There is plenty of room for two, and I won't tell. I promise it is warm and soft. But I'm dirty. My feet. If you're with me, I don't care about being dirty. It was too much. Food, a sympathetic shoulder, a warm bed. Sarah could not refuse. <laughs> Lavinia blew out her candle. They crawled into bed together, and for the first time in months, Sarah felt herself cradled in comfort. There was more than enough room for two tired little girls to lie side by side without touching, and yet Sarah felt fingertips brush against her arm. Sarah, what is it? Is this all right? It's fine. I'm tired. I'm sorry. Sarah thought, at first, that Lavinia was apologizing for keeping her from her well-deserved sleep, but then, I'm sorry I tried to take your doll away. In the darkness, she could not see Lavinia's face, but her words for once sounded sincere. Why did you want Emily? Because she was yours. Because if I could make you give in, that would prove that I was... What? Better than you. I'm not better than you. I know that. I'm no princess. It was the most vulnerable thing that Sarah had ever heard her say. Lavinia. Impulsively, she caught the other girl's hand in hers and squeezed it. Any girl can be a princess if she tries to be. Even you. Sarah considered Lavinia's startled laughter to be a quite melodious sound. Sarah Crew, you... You really are unique. The bedsheets rustled as Lavinia rolled closer. Sarah fancied that she could feel warm breath tickling her nose. Neither of them expected the bedroom door to be open from the outside. Sarah Crew, what is the meaning of this... this outrage? Miss Minchin! She leapt from the bed at once, striking the chair and stumbling in her haste. Did Lavinia arrange this? Was it all a trick? It can't have been. You wicked! No! Miss Minchin, please! Lavinia climbed to her feet, holding out a protective arm. It was my idea! She truly is defending me, just as I would have defended another. With that spark of rapport, Kindled in her heart, it was easy for Sarah to hear the intent behind Lavinia's next posturing words. I... I pitied her. She was respectable once. I wanted to perform a charitable act. I see. Your generosity and kindness are admirable. Sarah could not see Miss Minchin's face clearly, but the sweetness of her words was strained. However... Too much softness disrupts an orderly household. There are worthier ways to give. Come along, Sarah. But I... You may not keep a scullery girl in your room. It is improper. Your father would not approve. My father would have approved of kindness. And look what a mess you've made of your hair. You look like a little savage. <sighs> At those words, Lavinia's resolve flagged. Her arm fell limp to her side, and Sarah was exposed to Miss Minchin's reach. Sarah, come here, now. Yes, Miss Minchin. Once they were out of Lavinia's sight, Miss Minchin shoved Sarah's head roughly forward. Get to your rooms at once. Do you think I have time to chase after you girls all night? Her voice was low but harsh. You've already disrupted Miss Abbott's sleep. <gasps> Jessie! I won't have the entire house out of their beds. Jessie. Another push forced her to keep moving. Do not think that Miss Herbert's foolish fondness will grant you any extra privileges. Young ladies have their whims, but you are only a servant. Tonight the hour is late, but if I catch you overstepping your bounds again, you will be punished. Do you understand me? Yes, Miss Minchin. 
Is this what Becky faced in the past when I tried to be kind to her? See that you do not forget it. The steady clack of her heels moved down the stairs, leaving Sarah once again alone in the cold and dark. Oh my gosh. She could not help but compare her bed with those two few moments, soft and stolen by Lavinia's side. For just a moment I thought she was almost. But it is too late. If Miss Minchin catches me with Lavinia, she will punish me. I am so tired of being punished, you guys. You know that I am an inveterate shipper of Sarah Jesse, but but I may have to reevaluate that stance because I really do like Lavinia too. Maybe we can have like a poly triad. You guys know I'm fond of those. That's why I keep writing them. <laughs> okay. This is Sarah's neighbor, who is the guy that got her dad killed. And who is looking for her. What should we do? What about pride? I'm sorry, my nose keeps running because I keep crying. I don't mean to sniff into my microphone. Okay, so we're locked off until week 36. And as you will recall, Sarah meets the servant of the man next door who was looking for her. That was the Indian man that climbed into her room looking for the monkey. And they become friends. And he pities her and gives her room a makeover, although I think we haven't gotten to that yet. All right, Lavinia, pain and sorrow. <clears throat> I'm going to take a drink. Hold on. Please wait. Sarah was crouched down, cleaning a smudge off the wainscot when Lavinia's voice lashed out at her. Sarah, where have you been? Sarah did not lift her head to give the other girl attention. I have to work. You've been avoiding me again. I'm very busy. How can you be too busy to see me? I'm a student here. You have to come when I call. You have to obey me. I have to obey Miss Minchin first. I'm not telling you to stop doing your chores, just to visit me too. I'll help you like I did before. Pay attention to me. You aren't even looking at me. I thought you cared. Sarah pressed her hand against the wall for support. She took in a breath and let it out with a great huff. Don't you recall how scornful you were of me for spending time with Becky when I was still the parlor boarder? How you called Becky impertinent for overstepping her bounds? It's hardly the same thing. You were born. I am a servant. I am just the same as Becky. You're nothing like her. She's a girl from the poorhouse who can't even read. You are like me. We are all alike. All of us. Any one of us could have been born rich or poor, and it's chance, pure chance, if we were or weren't. And none of that matters to Miss Minchin. We live under her control and her rules. If we go against her orders, we will be punished. If you want to be a flawless English rose, you shouldn't be too familiar with the help. She turned and began to mount the stairs, leaving Lavinia with her mouth hanging open. Sarah thought that would be the end of it, that Lavinia, once rebuffed, would return to her old patterns. But after a moment's pause, her shoes rattled up the stairs. You're just making excuses. I can't. Look at me. I don't believe you're avoiding me because of what's ladylike. You never cared about that. I told you, Miss Minch requires. You never minded what she thought before. Why are you lying to me? 
Aren't we friends, Sarah? If we are friends, then why, when I said I was busy, did you say I had to obey you? Because you do! Sarah said nothing. I didn't mean it that way. I meant that you could always say that I'd ordered you and you had to leave your chores and do what I said. Isn't that right? It doesn't make a difference. Miss Minchin will punish me all the same. Then tell me how I can help. I can't trust you. You offer me treasures with one hand and snatch them away with the other. Sarah, please leave me alone. No! Don't walk away from me. Don't leave me. Sarah looked up at the older girl looming so close. She was aware of how thin, thin and fragile she had become in her months of suffering. In a battle of force, she would fare no better than a bird's wing under a cat's paw. Yet Sarah could not find fear in her heart. Beneath all the snarling and hissing, Lavinia was only another little girl, just the same as she was. What is it that you want? I want you to love me! Oh my. Hello. Lavinia laid her hand alongside Sarah's cheek, and she felt a curious shudder run down her back. You're the only one that matters. You're like me. You know everything about who I really am. And if you won't love me, then what else is there? The pain in those words knifed straight through Sarah's tender soul. Oh, Lavinia. Do I love you? Could I love you? A whirlwind of memories paraded past Sarah's bruised heart. Lavinia, her classmate and almost friend, lecturing her on proper behavior, alternately haughty, conspiratorial, and pleading. Lavinia, who had tortured and tormented her before, weeping with self-loathing. You could be so much better than you are. You are intelligent. You can be charming. You're curious, inventive, daring. If you weren't always trying so hard to make yourself seem exemplary, if you were honest with your feelings. But you are being honest with me now, aren't you? Like the quick flash of light across a tilting mirror's surface, it struck her. I'm the one who's being cold. Cautiously, Sarah reached up. Her fingers brushed Lavinia's shoulders and, closing her eyes, pulled the other girl against her into an embrace. It will be better someday for both of us. What? What are you doing? Holding you. <laughs> Look at the little hand. No, no touch. Sarah could hear Lavinia's pulse dancing inside her. The body that she held was stiff, arms still out at awkward angles. <laughs> no touchy. Has no one ever cuddled you before? It's all right. Put your arms around me. Sarah! Sarah Crew! Oh my god! Just fuck off! What are you, a professional asshole? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare the kitty. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go back to sleep. Sarah Crew! Sarah's eyes snapped open to find an unwelcome hazard making its appearance. Unhand that young lady at once. I. No sooner had she relaxed her hold on Lavinia than Miss Minchin grabbed Sarah by the arm and flung her bodily against the wall. What? Miss Herbert, go to your room. I will speak to you presently. As for you, she aimed her scorn at Sarah, who was now staggering to her feet. Come with me. Miss Minchin marched Sarah up the stairs to her attic, pausing only to pick up a small item. All the fear that Sarah had not felt in her encounter with Lavinia came washing back over her now. Her legs shook as they mounted the stairs. What else could I have done? What else could I have done? Inside the dingy garret, Miss Minchin lifted her head and sneered down upon her unfortunate charge. Apparently, you require a stronger lesson. 
Hold out your left hand and keep it still. Do not squirm or this will be worse. Obedient, Sarah proffered her palm. The cane swung down in a blur, burning a line across Sarah's hand. The pain followed in a terrible flash as if her hand had been cut to the bone. She cried out, her knees folding under her, but Miss Minchin caught her by the wrist. One more, I think. It was no easier to take a second stroke. It was worse knowing what to expect. Her whole body convulsed with the shock of it. She could see her hands in front of her, see that the skin was not broken, not bleeding, but the knowledge did not make the pain any less. That should give you something to remember. I will not have you working your sly ways among the upstanding young ladies of this establishment. You were worth less than dust to them, do you understand? You should not even be in their sight. Perform your duties and keep to your own kind. Sarah held her fiery, throbbing hands in front of her. She did not trust herself to meet Miss Minchin's eyes. What was there for her to say? That it was Lavinia who had sought her out, who had demanded her attention? It made no difference. Whatever happens, it will always be seen as my fault. If Miss Minchin beats me to death, even that she will call my fault. You are quiet. Good. Let this be the last time we have this conversation. If you will not obey, then you will not be permitted to remain. As you will not be able to complete today's tasks, you will have no food tonight or tomorrow. It was this last petty cruelty which cracked Sarah's resolve. Her legs buckled and she collapsed to the floor, her marked hands cupped uselessly on her knees. They will tear me in two, both of them, Lavinia and Miss Minchin. They will take and take until there is nothing left. Nothing I can do will ever be enough. Oh, Papa, why did you have to die? Oh, my gosh. You guys, my heart is just... Ow. Oh. I have an ow heart. Okay. So things are getting slightly better for us. Oh. Oh yeah. So 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 the 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 guy, the the nice Indian guy next door remodeled our room, which was lovely. And Miss Minchin the 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 uh, they also sent presents to the door and Miss Minchin realized that someone is sending Sarah's presents. And so she realized that Sarah might have relatives and she might there might be more money in keeping her or at the very least it might be unwise to keep her as a servant so now she's a student again I have no idea what we should be studying though that's that's the other thing oh, cancel. Oh. let's just do a little bit of, of everything I guess Look at how pretty our room is now. Oh, there we go. So this was, <laughs> we didn't actually have to, 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 to decide what to study. Sarah goes next door to meet the nice guy. They realize she's the Sarah crew that he's been looking for. Ms. Minchin tries to keep her as a student to, you know, wring more money out of her. And Sarah says, I do not wish for any harm to come to you. I do not want to hurt you as you have hurt me, but I will never belong to you again. And so we move on. Yay, happy ending, finale. There was a great bustling around the front of Miss Minchin's select seminary as all of Sarah's belongings, and Becky's as well, were removed and carried out to the house next door. The proprietress could do, herself could do nothing but sand and fume, to have had such a chance and let it slip from her fingers. The girls were abuzz with whispers and rumors. Those who had been friends, like kind, dependable Ermengarde, came forward to wish Sarah good fortune on her travels. Others hid themselves away in shame at their own past behavior, 
her chagrin for not keeping up a connection which might now prove to be valuable. As for that most dear and difficult of relationships, even now it failed to fall into a predictable pattern. Lavinia stood near the doors, seeming untroubled by all the goings-on. How things do change! What do you mean? Look at yourself, Sarah Crew. First you were my protege, and then with a stroke of fate, you became an heiress, Miss Minchin's favorite, the jewel in her crown. And just as quickly that crown was lost and you were little better than a slave. And now you will be a princess again. One hardly knows what to expect on the morrow. Sarah had, by now, known Lavinia too long and too well to take those arch words for true feeling. She stepped closer, but the older girl bit her lip and looked away. You will become a princess and leave us. We are beneath you now. No one ought to be beneath anyone else, especially not a friend. And anyone, anyone can be a princess. I think you could make a very good one. Lavinia made a tiny sound, more of a hiccup than a laugh, and wiped at her eyes. Just like that? Exactly so. Stop trying to be ordinary. Be extraordinary. A princess is a princess, even if she is in rags. She must be kind and noble and polite, generous to those around her, brave in the face of adversity. I could never be that perfect. No one is. Not all of the time, but we must keep trying. And if I do all that, do you think that you could love me? Oh, Lavinia, don't you know? I already do. You do? Of course. But how? Why? Everyone deserves to be loved. Even dolls and cats and dreadful people. At those words, in full sight of the school and Mr. Carrisford's hired movers, Lavinia dissolved into noisy tears. Leave her alone! Jessie came running out of Miss Minchin's seminary, her hair flying behind her like a banner of war. Jessie? The fierce expression was all for Sarah. Just because you are a princess again, just because Lavinia can be difficult, that's no excuse for making her cry. While Lavinia blinked at this unexpected defense, Sarah laughed and caught both of their hands in hers. I forgive you for doing harm. Both of you. What harm did Jessie do? Ugh. That is for Jessie to tell you. I think that both of you have been keeping many secrets that you need to share with each other. You must take care of each other now when I'm gone. Jessie looked up at Lavinia and smiled with shy hope. But will I ever see you again? No, don't leave. I want the three of you to... No, this is not the ending I want. Gosh dang it. I'm going to have to... Have head cannon. Of course you will. I can write to you. We can arrange outings. The museums, the London Zoological Society, all sorts of things. It will be easier to be friends, intimate friends, once we are away from Miss Minchin's sight. Yes. Jessie's smile faded then, and she shifted away. No, don't leave, preparing to disappear and leave them to their tender farewells. Wait! Jessie, can Jessie come with us? She's your best friend, isn't she? She let go of their hands and stepped back. I must go, else I will keep saying goodbye until nightfall. Swiftly, she kissed Lavinia's cheek and Jessie's as well. Keep watch over Miss Minchin for me. Don't let her use her new scullery maids too harshly. You are her princesses now. Jessie and Lavinia looked at each other with newborn purpose, and Sarah's heart was glad. I was right after all. The future will be better for all of us. Um, that wasn't awful. Just I wanted something a little bit more definitively Yuri than we will be friends and go to museums together. <laughs> yes, 
I am shipping trash. If you're new to this channel, you know now. Um, so, okay, wow, that was Lavinia's, um, arc. Those of you who predicted that she was anti-India because she was, she had an Indian mother and, and was afraid of that being found out right on the money there. Um, I, I am very slightly uncomfortable with how the mixed race girl at school is the one presented as passionate and violent and even on the verge of mental illness and, and again violence the cat the bird all that stuff that we kind of sipped through here um you know throwing sarah up against the wall it, it, this is one of those things that i think wouldn't have been a problem if there were more mixed race students there but there weren't so this is our only example of one so it's kind of uh, falling into the stereotype of you know white english people being calm and thoughtful and and mixed race or people of color being you know more passionate and violent i mean there you go right there um I, you know again she had good reason to be passionate carrying around the secret with her i don't i don't mean to say that in text it doesn't make sense it does uh i just i wish we had other examples of people who aren't well i, I guess there's the the nice indian guy across the street he, he is not um like lavinia so so there is that and i just happened to skip all his scenes for this playthrough so that that wasn't really there to even out the portrayal um and you know, as slightly uncomfortable as I said with, with Sarah, the little white girl explaining to the mixed race girl who frankly has way more to worry about in English society because yeah, the English at this point of time in time especially were just very racist. So, you know, Lavinia's fears are real and valid. And to just be like, you can totally be a princess. Just be you. Be extraordinary. Let people love you for who you are. She doesn't have quite the same options as Sarah does. So, uh, on the one hand, a good heartwarming message. On the other hand, maybe a tiny bit tone deaf in how it was delivered. Um, but you know, that's just me, you know, nitpicking because it's what I do. I nitpick things. That was beautiful. I loved it. I cried. Obviously, you got to hear me cry. You got to hear me sniff in my microphone. I'm sorry about that. My nose runs when I cry. Um, it was good. I liked it. Um, and wow, it was a lot faster when I skipped all the scenes, which I felt really guilty for because I was like, oh, crap, they don't know what's going on. But at the same time, I had to skip them. You, it took like seven videos to do Jesse's, uh, you know, start to finish for those 35 weeks or whatever. And we're going to manage to do, we did Lavinian 2. So, which was still, gosh, like three hours total? Four? I'm not sure. I didn't set a timer when I started. Um, I do want to play through the rest of them. I, I especially really want to play through Mariette's story. I love her. I want to play through Becky's story. I like her too. Um, Ermengarde and, and Lottie, I am slightly less interested in. I like them both. I like Ermengarde, Ermengarde. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not as taken with them as I, I was with Jesse and Lavinia. Um, but I, I will try to do them. I know I always say that and then I always leave you guys hanging and I'm sorry. It's literally just... <laughs> I have 24 hours in a day and I've got this book over here I'm writing on. I've got that book over there I'm writing on and I've got to make a blog post and a Patreon post and I want to do a Let's Play. And so a lot of times the Let's Plays fall to the, the bottom of the list and I'm sorry for that. Um, speaking of all those things I just talked about, if you're interested, I do write books. They're on Amazon.com is under Anna Mardal. Um, they're really good books. I like them. <laughs> I, I have a blog, which is AnnaMardell.com, where I write other stuff. And I have a Patreon, if you're a Patreon person, where I write little short stories that are fun and, and fantastical, and, and they're good too. Um, and then, of course, I have a Let's Play channel. You're here now, and if you want to subscribe, that always makes me so happy to see my subscribers go up. And I do try to read all the comments, even if I don't always respond to all of them. And um, 
wow thank you for being here i i i really like doing these even if i don't do them as often as i as i'd like to i enjoy doing them and i really love that other people like listening to them and hearing them so uh the screen says thank you for playing and i will add to that thank you for listening this is a little lily princess it's by hanako games um who seem in all my interactions with them to be really nice wonderful people um good folks and they're really good to let's players as well um so if you want to get into their games they're on steam uh they've done a little lily princess they've done um uh long live the queen which i've done a lot of let's plays on they have another game sort of recently newish out called black closet which i have purchased i haven't played it yet i i plan to do a let's play on that once I finish all the other things that I plan to do a Let's Play for. Um, so yeah, that's, if you want more, if you can't get enough Hanako games, that's where to find them. Find them on Steam. Um, I will see you in the next Let's Play. Once again, my name is Anna Mardell, and thank you so, so much for being here. You have a good one. Bye-bye.